Hey, hey, book lovers. Welcome to What You're Reading, the podcast where I connect with fellow book enthusiasts to chat about our latest reads, the topics that fuel our bookish obsession, and all those things that keep us glued to those pages. Welcome back, everyone. In today's episode, you are going to be listening in on our buddy read discussion of Hood Feminism by Mickey Kendall. This is a nonfiction book, so while we do dive deep and talk pretty in depth, about some of the themes and things that were mentioned throughout this book. I don't consider this discussion to be full of spoilers. However, if you do not want to hear any of our thoughts and opinions on this book, then I suggest you read the book first and then come back to this episode. We're going to be talking about our first impressions of the book, what we think feminism was and how it is or is not affecting our lives today. And then we conclude a little bit with what we feel like our responsibility is now, if any, to educate and share about feminism, about the civil rights movement and just about history in general. If there are specific things that do interest you about this conversation, please refer to the show notes because there are going to be timestamps so you can flip right to the sections that you want to hear about. All right, guys, let's get into it. So I think I want to start off just curious. Do you guys read or listen to the book? Both. Both? I did half and half. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. I listened. Okay. I did. I think I read like the first couple of chapters. I could probably like pin my notes. Yeah. The first two chapters, the introduction and the first two chapters. And yeah, I had to switch over to audio because it was, um, it's really dense. It was really like textbook heavy, which made it interesting. Okay, good. So I just wanted to get that out there first. And then my second like initial question before I just like say like, what did you guys think? is what kind of knowledge or whatever did you guys have of feminism? I've never really like, I've heard about it, right? And I think like when I think feminism, I think votes for women. I don't know if it's because Mary Poppins or what, but like I literally just think like votes for women, rights for women, like 19, early 1900s to 1960s maybe, And then like, I don't know, like, I don't think about, like, I don't think about it in a modern movement. So I feel like this book was a little interesting on that aspect. Did you guys, Uh, do you guys have any thoughts about feminism or like for your initial? I always thought of it with the perspective, like during this, you know, like civil rights movement, we were still fighting for a lot of equal rights and equal pay. And uh, I always thought about it in that vein. And I was kind of thinking since the laws changed, we should be, I feel like the feminism movement kind of took a back. Like they were full on burning burning laws laws in the 60s. And, you know, they were trying to talk about um, like harassment in the the workplace. I don't feel like it was a successful conversation, Um, but I felt like there was a lot of that in the 60s and 70s. And then more recent with the Me Too movement, it came to the forefront again. Um, but I don't know if, and I feel like I took a feminism class. It couldn't have been that memorable in college if if I don't have a lot to say about it. <laughs> just curious, what age range are you guys? 38 for me. I just okay. turned 39. Okay. Interesting. How, Alika, how old are you? You're millennial. I know you're in that millennial bracket. Oh, I'm 40. So we're all, it's pretty okay. close. 40 okay. okay. Yeah. I can't go with what I thought initially What with you guys. Oh, that we're like. Jen yeah oh you're so young so clearly you don't have any understanding so it makes sense I can't go (laughs) um so first of all feminism is a white woman movement that's just Mm -hmm. what it is so I never cared about it because it never was designed for all women and it was never designed for equal whites it was designed so white women can get their way that's just the reality of it I think the book which probably why it felt so textbooky. It was kind of proving her point by using data and statistics to prove that feminism was very linear. It was intended so that white women can have more say in their households, really. So I can go to work if I want to, whatever. So for me, I thought the book was, I'm not gonna say I thought it was good or bad. It was what I expected, I think. So I like books that um, 
when you're trying to prove your point that you use stats, then just talking like sometimes when I talk, I'm like, I don't have enough proof of what I'm saying. I'm just talking from my experience. I think mm-hmm. she did a good job of saying, here's my experience. Here's the data behind why I'm writing this book. So, yeah. I agree with having the data because I think like a book like this is really important. I think maybe what was missing it for me was I read last year, I read two really good books that could have been really, they were still kind of heavy, but I just felt like the balance between the data and the way that they use storytelling to back up the data. And I know she used her personal experience, but I think I just wanted maybe more of that to, to help bridge what she was saying. So last year I read Clint Smith's, um, how the word was, how the word is passed and, um, oh my gosh, Donovan Ramsey's when crack was King and specifically when crack was King, I like, you know, we, we all grew up hearing about the crack epidemic and, you know, all of that, but I never had any context to it. So he used four people in different life settings to emphasize his points behind um, this, the crack epidemic. So, you know, it, it followed that and then he, he put the data in it and I just thought it was so beautifully done. And I guess I was, I didn't realize I was hoping this was going to be something like that because that's why I had to switch to audio. Cause at one point I was just like staring at the paragraphs and I'm like, she is, she's losing me here. <laughs> this is this. I feel like I'm in class. This is a lot. And I think for me, there's, when we're reading these types of books, I feel like there's a target demographic. So like when I was reading it, everything she said, I was like, yes, duh, of course, Mm -hmm. half of these experiences, I've had the same. Mm -hmm. Um, So it wasn't necessarily for me, I feel. Um, But then if she is talking to like white women in the feminism movement, there's no actionable steps either. So I, I missed on, I like that she had the data, but there's, I, I personally like actionable steps. Like I, yes, the entire um, chapter that she wrote, and then this is what you can do. This is what we can do. This is how we can bridge the gap together. This is the legislation that needs to change. Like I, I came out of the book with nothing, but then I, again, I feel like it's not for me, but then I would never refer the book to someone because what would they get from it other that than that feminism initially was a white woman's movement and not meant for black people but that's that's the paragraph Mm -hmm. I don't feel like that's a book Mm -hmm. and I just maybe she can just write like a a workbook afterwards (laughs) a workbook (laughs) in addition to in addition to the foot uh, like hood feminism book this is the actionable steps like maybe that I feel I feel like that's what I want from her because I don't feel like it was written bad I was okay with how dense it was it's just I got nothing from it and I don't know what someone would take from it if they want to help. So when I started it, after a couple of chapters, I was like, if I was a white woman, I'm out. Don't comment at me like this. Like, and I knew she, she started like by saying like, she's not the nice person. Like she's the, let's get it done. All of that. And I appreciate that. And I got it, but I was like, oh, is she losing her audience in these first couple of chapters because of how hard hitting she's going? I don't, and I'm just curious if you felt any of that, or I mean, you're so open there, or if you were just like, I'm leaning in, I'm listening. Okay. Yeah. So like a lot of what all of you have said, and again, like JJ and I had a conversation kind of recently. So sorry if I repeat myself, JJ, but like, I did like the book, like Brittany said, some of it, it, it was like kind of a mashup of, you know, like the text and the personal experience, but a lot of it, I felt like the chapters could have been a lot shorter. Like I, I get your point and I want to learn and agree with your point. But then sometimes I felt like she started talking in circles or repeating herself over and over, which I think a lot of what you said, you said in the first bit and like, um, there was a lot of me and then maybe to make it a full book, like the point kind of got repeated, but not necessarily, like I would have loved some like additional personal experience or something like that. So, and so in JJ and mine's conversation, I had said like, yeah, a lot of it, like I have to read and then like sit with for a while and just sit there and be like, okay, like, how do I feel about this? And I had told JJ, like a lot of times your my first reaction is to be defensive. And then, so then like, I have to sit for a second and be like, okay, <laughs> you know? And so it takes me a little bit of time, like literally just time, like sitting there thinking like, okay, what's actually been saying? What is applicable? How has that shown up in my life and um 
and in my actions and in the way, you know, like I've been conditioned and all those things as well. It didn't lose me. Um, but I also like, I know, um, I don't know like full history of feminism, but like, yes, first wave feminism was totally in my mind. First wave feminism was totally white women to live within the patriarchy, right? Mm -hmm. Like they were playing by patriarchy's rules rather than being like, we want to be mm -hmm. fully formed beings and women, you know? Um, and then second wave was to a bit more intersectionality, but like didn't really do that well. And um, blah, blah, blah to where are we? Th I think we're in fourth wave feminism right now. If, if I understand correctly depending on who's reading it. Yeah. I could see, you could feel real defensive if it's the first book you've picked up or the first interaction you've had with some of that, but then I don't know. So maybe you're going to get hit with that and not keep going. Um, there were a lot of things like I had to sit and pause and think about myself. And then a lot of things I just had to sit with and be like, I've never had that experience. And so I just need to sit with somebody else's experience and like really let that sink in for a while too. I have two perspectives just to your point is one going back to JJ's first statement is like I kind of know what I was getting into in this book like I like to like kind of get spoilers ish when I read stuff that way I'm not like irritated so I kind of knew what I was going into so I I knew that it was coming from the perp this is my my opinion right my perspective my experience and I'm throwing data into it so I knew that she wasn't going to give any like next steps to your point though that I think if her intent was like to white feminists to say, how can you incorporate all these other demographics that she was trying to highlight? Um, here are some tools to do so. I think that would have been way more effective. One. And two, also to your point, Rissa, I thought it was interesting. Like it's it not, it, it didn't just feel repetitive. It was almost like, oh yeah. And so like towards the end, I actually literally sped it up to two, to two, to two point, whatever to like, just get through it. Cause at the end, it just felt like, oh yeah. And I don't want to forget about um, kids who've been adopted. Oh yeah. I don't want to forget about um, people from LGBT plus community. It didn't feel as intentional because that wasn't her experience. And the rest of the book to me came a lot from her experience. And then like, here's my experience, here's my data. And then the end was like, oh, I don't want to leave out these other marginalized communities because, hey, this is a book about feminism. So yeah, I feel like the last four chapters could have been something else ended and then leaving some room for intentional reflection. Because I think what would be really cool is like somebody like me who's like passionate about stuff like this to be able to have converse like let this be a conversation starter so that we can actually do something right so now like somebody like you Rissa, I can say well here's some more examples of people's my experience so here's now how we can come together but since she didn't do that you're kind of left to your own devices to hopefully now <laughs> make change mm -hmm. versus oh. just like here's my opinion with sets so yeah yeah, that's one of the reasons book club is so valuable to me. And this book club in particular, like I'm in a couple of book clubs and to do this with like my white church background book club would not be super helpful, right? You know, like unless you're part of the conversation as well. And um, for me, yeah, like I read this knowing, okay, I get to come talk to these ladies about it and like get feedback and your perspective. And like when you guys are like, yeah, old news, like I was like, okay, I'm just going to sit here and listen. Alika, kind of to back up your point, and maybe this would have helped, you know, me a little bit, is after I was done, like, I had this thought of, like, what is the feminist, like, what is the feminist movement now? And I can't remember if it was Brittany and I or who I've had this conversation with, but I've thought, like, some of our struggle as Black people, I feel like, in a current, like, Black Lives Matter movement or whatever, like, the civil rights movement is now is in the 60s, we had clear, 50s, 60s, there was clear voting rights, um, you know, being treated like uh, like every other human being, being able to get loans, um, own homes, you know, in segregation. Like there were like these huge staples that were the goal. And so now I kind of feel like on some parts, we're still fighting for some of those things, right? So like, I see like, on a larger scale, how some of those issues are still prevalent, but I just feel like there's so many different things that so many different people are facing and fighting that I feel like it it kind of, or at least to me, feels like, where do I start or what do I do? And I feel like this book, after I closed it, I was like, 
what does the feminist movement even look like now? Like, is like, what are the quote unquote feminist organizations? What are they, are they bringing things up in legislation? Like the first and only one that really comes to mind is gun violence. And other than that, it's like, okay. And, you know, I've heard, you know, people talking about fentanyl and making our, you know, streets safe and, and, you know, how to mitigate the effects of the drug and all of that kind of stuff. But I, I don't know, I guess I just, I ended the book and I was just kind of like wishing it was like, here are some organizations to, to even follow, not necessarily to join, but to follow or to continue your education or, you know, any of that. Cause now I'm left again with my own devices to get onto Google and just kind of hope I find a good one. So, um, from my perspective, (laughs) although she did not help this at all, I'm about to say, it's just because I'm very passionate about the fact that our world is a dumpster fire. Um, so I'll say it like this, if she would have included the topics about like what's happening, some of this is like date, not dated, but I'll think of, I'll just go like current. The fact that like the fearless fund and Alice um, funds are being sued for discrimination because they're giving grant money to black women. And they're saying now it's reverse um, segregation or something like that. So just to reuse terms that were intended to give us opportunity to now remove opportunity because the needle got moved from 0.006, no, 0.003% to 0.006%. Now we can't continue to give money to black organizations. So I think if she would have been intentional about saying like, hey, do you realize like the 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 legislation on voting rights is actually coming up in 2020. 25 or whatever it is like and then from there now you can go do your own google search and say hey i didn't realize that these things are coming back up or how roe visa's raid and all that was overturned so to your point jj i do think it would have been more valuable or even just on because i actually went to her website i was like there's not even anything on her website that leads to like hey here's how you can take the next steps right so yes thank you for validating me individually in my frustrations but now there's no action steps or no tools to say, hey, this is what you can do, or here are the issues that that the feminist movement combated and are actually coming back up. I think that's just like a missed point. I feel like the feminism movement between that and some of the rights that we're talking about, I think that there was a level of complacency over the last couple of decades. Um, and that decades is an entire generation. And yes. one of the one things that my dad talks about, like JJ, when you were saying these were the five points, they were never not thinking about it. Like it was always forefront of their mind. They were, I mean, like from the time that they were born to the time, like even now, like they were always thinking about it. They were always planning the next move. What are we doing together as a community to fight for the rights, like equal rights? And I feel like um, for sure in the Black community and then um, yes, women, I feel like it's like, the fight wasn't as immediate of a need. And I think that there was a level of like, again, complacency, but not necessarily knowing, right? If you've grown up thinking that it's a little bit better and you're not going to protest starting at four five, six and fighting for, you know, like if you're not in that fight, um, it doesn't occur to you until something happens to you. And I feel like that's where the feminism movement is, is like, until they're harassed at work in their workplace in their 20s and they're like oh wait what's happening or people with the Roe versus Wade being pulled back um like because they're in the moment of um like everything that's going on with the IVF situation yes that's what happens when you when you name some cells on a platter a baby that is exactly what happens that legislation can happen people can get sued and the entire process stops i feel like it's like not until these things happen to people do they decide to make the move um and it's frustrating for me i really wish that again i do wish that there were resources but like in this book and i wish that we would continue to push resources because i feel like our generations between millennials some z's a lot of uh x's they don't really um they're not activated the same way. And if I hear one more person my age say, I'm not political, I feel like my head might explode. Yes. Um, because it affects us so much. We cannot afford, we as women and we as Black people cannot afford to not be political. That's not, yep. you're, you're throwing your vote in the garbage. You're allowing for all this stuff to happen around you. And then once it affects you in your 20s and 30s and you're like, oh wait, what's happening? And then you don't know how government works 
I think you make a great point. So I was at a um, talk the other day and the girl who was hosting the talk said that her first opportunity to vote um, was Obama. So her her whole context is like Obama and then where we are now. Nothing pre that. Mm -hmm. So her viewpoint on like changing the world is we've had a black president. Mm -hmm. Right. So pre that somebody like I think of me who's voted two Bushes ago is like I had to know where they stood. Regardless if I wore the t-shirt or the hat or whatever bull people put a, put along the, the idea of being political, but actually thinking through like, oh, this is what they stand for. This is what they believe. What are the lesser two evils? Who am I actually fighting for all of that? Because to your point, I experienced enough in life to be able to say, I have to know what's happening. And I think when she made her point, it actually was really disappointing. She was saying that like us girlies who have, um, who have had, high positions like not necessarily c-suite but like are making six figures before 30 aren't thinking about life in the context of um what it was like two generations ago when there was no woman who was able to make that much because she had to only work in her home so when you when you have no thoughts of that but I was like for me I was like that's not necessarily her issue that's kind of her mom's fault right it's kind of her mom's fault yeah. to say to not have and I'm saying, and I want to remove her as an individual and I'm making a statement blanketly about people who feel Correct. this way. Her, she was just a caveat for me to show grace basically to the, to this group of people that their parents mm -hmm. didn't have the conversation. So I would say something like if I had children and I never had a conversation with them about like, at one point we couldn't go to school with the kids that you're friends with. Right. Mm -hmm. So let's find value about find still find value in the fact that we get to sit in a classroom with people from all demographics especially growing up in Vegas like that was unheard of for my grandparents when we talked about it mm -hmm. so it's like the generation before is not giving enough not having enough conversations with the current generation so that the people are saying things like I'm not political or how JJ just made me shake my head and be like I have no idea what the feminist movement really was right <laughs> Because if it's not taught in schools, if our parents aren't telling us this, but we're, we as women are can see people in these positions that were fought for, then we have no context of like, oh my gosh, legislation could change and we can lose all of this. Because you don't know that these are laws, right? This isn't just given. These sure. are laws that can be pulled back, right? Clearly the last two years is proof of all the laws that have been overturned that give people rights to do certain things. So. Yeah. yeah. And I, I feel like it was in an, I, I almost want to say that it was intentional with some of the parents that they didn't want to like put the impression on their kid or have these tough conversations. Like, I don't want my child to see color. I don't want them to know that there's a different in gender, but you're doing them a disservice and you're doing our society a disservice that there is a historical difference between people of color and for men and women we do not get equal pay so for you to bring up your female daughter in an environment thinking that like not educating them on what has happened before whether they're black or not if you're just telling your you can do anything you want you're like and then once she does make it to six figures you're right she's not looking around her she's not helping other mm -hmm. women There's so many things that you do need to do it's great that you got to the six figures under 30 high five that is not everybody that's not a lot of people and mm -hmm. You need to be actively, I almost feel like we still need to be actively helping, right? So yeah. if you do make six bucks under 30, you need to be an active voice in the room trying to encourage this behavior in uh, in your workplace, in legislation. Like you need to still be active. If you have such privilege and like with that, you need to do everything you can to continue this message. We can't just sit and be complacent with everything. That's exactly how everything is happening that's exactly how Roe versus Wade got rolled back us sitting around thinking everything is hunky-dory and we're fine well I think that speaks to I think it's like the 90s where there was probably a lot of apathy from women because they were then in the workplace right like by that point there were more women working and then I think it was kind of like maybe looking around like okay we're here but again they fit within the patriarchal structure right so like they're not really fulfilled and getting all these things that Oh, wait, now I just have more work. I don't know, like, if you're a parent, but like, now I'm a work, like a working mom. And like, no, what I really need is like support and all these other things and legislation that provides for all these things. But now I'm just doing a full time job of my kids and a full time job at the office. And I've only looked for myself. I've only looked out for myself. So even though like, 
people of color and it's not fair for everybody else. Like, oh, I'm stuck here. And so there's not, there wasn't like that push of white women for something different, I think, because it was like, oh, we kind of got where we thought we were maybe going. But I think to her point, like the book point of like, so we kind of got there, but feminism isn't just getting a job now, you know, it's like, you need to provide for the food housing and the insecurity, you know, all that sort of stuff as well, which if you make like a, I wasn't going to say glo global's not the shift, but like, if you just shift, like you, all of that seems to have to come together. You know what I mean? Like you can't just parse out and that seems really obvious in the book, but also not. Yeah. I was yeah. literally saying, I feel like in the book, it's like, oh, okay. Yes. Here's all the examples. Great. Thank you for all the examples. Now what? Like, cause everything you just named, right? So the feminist movement gave us rights to be able to vote. Okay. Great. The feminist movement gave us opportunities to be able to, to work equally as in like job title. Cause clearly pay was not a part of the conversation. Um, but now what? So do, are we still, now that we're working, now that we're working, and I think she brought, she said one of the chapters, she talked about that, like the working, the idea of a working mom, how it's not, that's the part's not equal. Like, how do we make, how can the feminist movement now, if there even is one, be intentional about like supporting and rallying around these acts of working moms? And then like, even too, cause no, I'm not a parent and now I will never be a parent in that context by choice, but, um, but I also have a desire to support, right? I have five godchildren. So it's intentional about me showing up and being a support, whether it's something simple as babysitting or showing up to attract me, right? So how do we take both conversations of the working mom and the non-working woman and say, we are a team still, how can we support each other in this specific goal to JJ's point of here are five goals in making sure that equal pay happens in making sure that um, just like a mom can take off to go to her kid's recital, a, a, a single woman or whatever, a non-mom can take off to go to her niece's recital, like finding ways to, to make not everything equal, because I don't think everything is going to be equal and it's supposed to be equal, but at least balance out the level of equality that is happening. So she talks about it, but yeah, again, no. I really wish, I, in that vein, I really wish that she had a hit on like maternity leave. This is the legislation that we have currently. These are the bills that have not been passed. This is why they're stalled. Paternity leave. It is so important. This is why it's important. It's being stalled at the House Congress. This is why conservative uh, women and with their views, what, what do conservative Republicans stand for? And what it like, I feel like she, I wish she could have spelled it out yeah. because people, again, don't necessarily know how the government works. And when they say these things, like I will run into people and they'll say things like, oh, I'm conservative. And then, you know, we have a conversation later. I'm like, do you know what conservative means? I think you're confused about what's going on here. Nothing that you say stands for the conservative Republican party. And I just feel like you're confused. So I really wish that she had a spelled out certain things like that and I, I feel like that would those are actionable steps those are aha moments for people that's something that I could I sh would refer someone to to listen to or terminology right like if there could be a whole section on terminology so that we understand like okay hey, great you made this point and thank you for your experience but now what is the terminology beyond be behind the point that you just made with that so there were there were some parts in there where she like she talked about the only one name that I recognize, like just right off the bat, was um, Rachel Doz Dozell. <laughs> yeah, whatever. Mm -hmm. her, um, she was like the the white lady who yeah. like was trying to be. Not it's, trying the, to be it's still is still attempting to be a black woman. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, 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 yeah. She she says she's black. Um, she's cur so, currently so, still doing. Oh, is she currently? I I don't even. Want oh, to yeah. Um, but like she, she just kind of grazed over it. And I was like, like, it took me a minute to be like, why do I know that name? Why do I know that name? And then I was like, oh, I know who she's talking about, but she didn't give any like background to like who this person was or any of that. And so to, to the point, like she also talked about like, um, the confirmation of Brett Kavanaugh and how, you know, how like the women were coming forward, but even stuff like that, like that was to me, that was a, a missed opportunity to talk about how we, there was a president who not necessarily vowed, but because it's whatever president it is, is in, whether Democrat or Republican, they get to pick who gets on the next seat if someone is 
passed away or, you know, is retiring. And so I don't, I don't feel like she made some of that through line because honestly, if I were to give a book like this to my nieces, not my nieces, sorry, they're too young. If I was to give a book like this to my younger cousins who are in their mid twenties, a lot of this would go over their head. They wouldn't know Brett Kavanaugh. They wouldn't know Rachel. They wouldn't know any of maybe even of the Me Too movement or, you know, all of these different things that were coming up. Like, I think she was, there was a point where, um, excuse my language, but, you know, for anyone who's listening to the, to this episode, but it was like, um, what was it like pussy grabbing or whatever? Like, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, around with um, Donald Trump and like, they would know none of that. And so she didn't, I understood her point that she was trying Mm -hmm. to make about how important this is, but because she didn't necessarily just give either background or even a footnote where it, it mentioned that, or it talked about that, like, because now it's going over the head and it's like, oh, I don't know what that is. Because I mean, but some of the stuff you don't even know, right? No, that's true. That's true. Right. If you think about it from that context, if you don't know. And like your proximity is technically closer to some of these examples that she gave, how much more the further back you get in the generation. Which is why to my point earlier, if my friend is giving me that aha moment and letting me be able to show grace, but also speak up more to make sure that people around me are more, if they choose to be, are better educated, right? It's twofold. One, it's she should have done a better job, not assuming her reader knew what she was talking about. Mm -hmm. Number one. And then number two, it goes back to the point where I was like, it's it's like the generation before his responsibility to like highlight these are the things that have happened in the world. And like I said, some of these legislations that have happened can be overturned and people don't even know it. We can lose our voting rights. There is an right. opportunity for voting rights to be lost and not just for people of color, for women, let's stick and just sticking, sticking on that side of just women can be like, oh, you no longer are considered full humans again or whatever it was. I don't know the correct terminology, but so now we lost our voting rights. And some people are like, no, we can't. We've been voting for years. Yeah, no, it's only 10 generations ago. Like it, it's not that far away. So yeah, I think she should have done a better job of not assuming that her reader was aware of some of the topics that she was talking about. And then also that would have been a great opportunity to, to prompt like the reader to not only go do their own research, but make sure you're educating the people behind you. So. Right. Right. And I would have liked if she not only expanded on it, but like, why is it important? So background on who Brett Kavanaugh, how, but then how does that impact the way that the Supreme Court looks? Mm-hmm. How can that impact the rollback? At the time, Roe versus Wade had not been rolled back, but that was a key component of it being rolled back. Like she definitely could hit on that. Like they were stacking the court intentionally to push these specific laws that affect women. It's been so a plan. important. Yes, yeah. it's been a plan, yeah. and all of those were just too important that she really should have included. And, and she talks about it, but not enough. Like yeah, it's like she, mm-hmm. she takes for, she takes for granted the fact that you we do know about it. And I did know everything she was talking about, but all these people that are like not political <laughs> won't understand what she she said. Brett Kavanaugh's name. Yeah. That's it. She, no background. People are gonna take that initiative to go Google who he is, right? Yeah. yeah. It's like she even brought like Anita Hill in there for a half a second, right? Like <laughs> how many people don't know about that? Right. So even like when it was happening, people had no idea what was happening. So yeah. or the way it was talked about, where I was talking about from the standpoint of, oh, here goes another black woman putting another black man down. And it was very this one sided perspective versus like looking at it as a totality. So yeah, just a really big even then I feel like we're at the age that I had to go back and look at Anita Hill. Like I researched her later. It happened in the early 90s. So we were definitely like, I'm pretty sure I was watching Care Bears at the time. Like I <laughs> would need a hill later <laughs> right. in my right. own adult research. Not so even, th- even that, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like she really should have expanded. Um, I was going to, okay. I think there could have been some more, um, maybe like blind spots pointed out. I think a lot of people think they're doing good things or they're trying for good things. And so like what you may think is good about this legislation, like you think you're pushing something positive for your children in school, but this is how it actively harms. Not everybody, or you know what I mean? And like, I think she was trying to get to that point. And that's like how we talked in circles sometimes in the book, but like to very clearly directly say like, when you're voting for housing, that means not just that you got your house that you liked, but that means that these people got stuck in less than desirable houses, like more maybe like direct correlation. 
I think people think they're doing good, they but they don't know that blind spot. So if you could kind of connect to, I see you're pushing for X, Y, Z to happen at your school, that directly impacts funding at the school 10 minutes away that isn't getting, or, you know, things like that. I don't, I'm not coming up with examples off the top of my head very well, but. So I think that's a great one. Like a, if this, then that type of thing. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's so important and it makes me think of like, um, and I think the only reason that maybe I knew about it is because I was in New York at the time, or maybe just because I follow books, book people in New York, but, um, oh God, what is his name? Ma Mayor Adams. He like took funding from the public library system. And like, it was just like, oh, yep, we're going to take this. And then they're putting up barriers in the subway, which in my mind is going to make it harder for people to get on and off the, you know, the tracks and you got to do those things quickly before you, you get left behind, but they're going to now start putting up barriers because they think it's going to help people from jumping on the tracks. Can this money be funded and used somewhere else? Um, so I just think it's like really interesting that we can see some of those pieces on and, and I don't think this has been something that's been secret. Like he ran on more policing backing because mm -hmm. he has, you know, a background. So I think that's something like we just have to kind of zoom out more with. But I think that goes with your point of like, if this happens, like here are here are just some potential downsides to this decision. I feel like it made me more hopeless. It just kind of left me in this state of, okay versus like a rallying cry to oh my gosh I need to do something like again I'll mention reading how the word is passed like he goes if you're not familiar with the book Clint Smith goes to different um, landmarks so he went to Monticello he goes to Angola prison in New Orleans he visited what is it Bedford Cemetery where a lot of the Confederate soldiers are buried and they have like this national event every year so he he went to these places to one, see what they are teaching. Like, what are these tours teaching in terms of history, especially at Monticello? Are you teaching the fact that like, there are black descendants of Jefferson? You know, are you guys teaching this? Or are you kind of glossing over the fact and like all of that? And so he's having these tough conversations with not only the tour guides and the establishments, but then he's also talking to the people who are on the tour. What made you come out? How do you feel about the history that was being taught? And that excited me. It made me want to like, oh my gosh, more people need to read this. More people need to understand about some of these national landmarks and what's happening and how are we grappling with the effects of the what happened to the indigenous people when, you know, when America was being founded and with slavery and all of that. And this book didn't give me that I don't I don't know if I should say excitement at the end it didn't give me that people need to remember feminism or come back to feminism or we need to have an uprising of this moment like it didn't give me any I mean I feel the same as somebody who feels more passionate about it in general not just the, like not feminism at all the intent behind right. what I think was intended for right not myself. <laughs> um but I, I feel the same way. I don't feel like I left like, oh, let's go. Let's keep up. Let's, I just left like, this was a really nice share. Thank you so much for sharing your story with data. That's what this felt like. This was a, this was a nice read of her, her personal experience poked with data. And that's, how, that's kind of where I leave it. Like, is it a book that I would necessarily recommend? No. If somebody came to my house and wanted it off my bookcase to read, absolutely go for it it would not be on a favorites list at all. But uh, that because, and the reason why I wouldn't be on a famous, uh, favorites list is specifically like you guys said is there's no actionable steps. So there's nothing to, there's nothing to do with it. It's just like I read her story and she gave me data behind proving her experience. Thank you. It may have been a better like memoir. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, JJ and I did talk about the, uh, this. It reminds me of... Um, when they call you a terrorist, we talked about, um, and I really liked the same thing. JJ was kind of like, um, but it didn't like, there wasn't like an urgency or like prompt you to do something. And I wasn't coming at it from that. I was, tr I was coming at it from an informational like standpoint, like why did the black lives matter movement, like what ignited it? How did it, where did it come from? What birthed it? All of that. And 
Um, I think I kind of feel the same way about this. Like it was just like a broadening for me of like, I do like, I like feminism is important to me. Um, and now that like, I, I just believe like there's a lot of power in women and I believe women should have choice and opportunity. And it gives some like touch points to be able to speak on like, this is why I care about Planned Parenthood, or this is why I care about, um, you know, moms to demand action with gun control. And this is why I care about Project Maryland that provides free period supplies to the people I visit in the tunnels and things like, like all of those actually connect to my feminism as well and aren't like separate issues, but can right. all be like in support of women and the community. And I, but I, like, I do think it's in support of the community, but that women have like an, another layer to that to um, be considerate of. I think the only other note that I had, I, I wrote as Alika, as you were talking, it was about, you know, parents telling us things. And I, I've tried to have this conversation with my mom and she's just like, I don't know, it just wasn't top of mind. But there are so many things that I grew up not knowing that I feel like as a black child like other than the talk about how to interact with police and you know when you're driving don't drive crazy you know what I mean like other than those kind of things and then like you know the other you know never be ashy and you know always <laughs> have on lotion and make sure you look presentable when you go out the house and <laughs> in my household I like it it's different apparently now, but in my household, like you were never going outside in a bonnet or like if you had to like put a hat on, but the bonnet was never outside of the house. You're never wearing pajamas outside of the house. Like that was never an option. So that's just kind of how I grew up, but we never had much of a conversation of some of the more difficult things about womanhood or race. So yes, I learned about Martin Luther King. Yes, I learned about Malcolm X. I really only think I learned about Malcolm X because Denzel Washington was in the movie and my mom loves all Denzel Washington stuff. So that led to a conversation. And of course, roots and all of those things. But we never had a conversation about blackface. I didn't learn about minstrel shows until college. And I was livid sitting in Professor Armstrong's class at UNLV, seeing like this whole scene play out as he's talking about minstrel shows. And I'm like, what do you, what is this? <laughs> what do you mean? And like immediately having a conversation with my mom, like, uh, hello, how, how am I 19, <laughs> 20 years old? And I have never seen this. And, and then I remember the same thing in high school, um, never had a conversation of rape until I was in my sophomore year and we got to pick a book and I just picked speak and speak is the book about rape. And I was like, oh my gosh, like never knew. And then, so it was like a, Hey mom, like we've never had this conversation about like these, what is this? Is This is something that people do. And so I, I can attest to I think my parents were just trying to survive. They were trying to put food on our table. They were trying to keep a roof over our heads. They were trying to keep. So at this point, we had moved from the south side of Chicago to a suburb of Las Vegas. So they were trying to keep us in a nice area and a nice school or their definition of nice area and nice school. And they were just trying to give us a better quality of life. And I think that was just the main goal was getting by and not and and not necessarily having some of these hard conversations. So I empathize with people like my brother, I, my brother and sister. I took it upon myself at this point. Everything I know, y'all are going to know. Yeah. You've never seen Roots, Christian. Great. Uh, sit down. We're about we're here for a very long weekend because you're watching this. I don't care if you complain. I'll order you pizza. You'll be fine. We're watching this. So I think it takes those people being proactive. And like you said, Alika, stepping into lives of other children or even young adults, younger family members that are under us to kind of have some of these conversations and make sure that those kind of things don't get missed. But I just wanted to share that like, yeah, I've, I've been on the side of, not knowing a lot of stuff growing up and having and feeling like I had to play catch up even now because there's just so much that I wasn't aware of. I would also say that it, 
you have to intentionally. So I grew up on the South side of Chicago in an all black neighborhood. We didn't have to have conversations at the house because it was taken care of in the environment. Yes. So I feel like now it needs to be the intention like versus that was just taken care of in the hood. Like you, all of the, everything I, I seen the menstrual, like every single thing that mm-hmm. I know about black history, I was taught, I saw, we taught, you know, like, it's like, mm-hmm. all I have to do is sit down with my uncles real quick and they've pretty much covered. And I have a full grasp on what it looked like for them during the like sit-ins at the lunch counter. I don't have to worry about external. Well, I did do external education, but it's like, my basics are covered. And I feel like now as we get further away, we are starting to gravitate towards nicer communities, better education, white people, we're making more money and we're getting further away from the civil rights movement altogether. So I do feel like now it is an intentional education of the kids. I don't feel, because my dad worked all the time. I don't think we ever had any conversation I started asking him about college later because there was a there was a point where I put the dates together and I was like you were in college when MLK died like how did that even like how how was that day for you like it was like stuff like that but there was no he didn't have to educate me on on those things because that's so funny I had the opposite experience my parents told us everything like so constant like you go read this book like ask like so and I think that's why my person my, like when people I hear people say and again thinking about perspective when I hear people say certain things I'm like how and then I have to take a step back and be like oh like you had parents who were very vocal and open um but I think it comes from like three different perspectives one the evangelical like we don't want our kid we don't want to have the rape conversation with our kids because whatever biblical whatever goes along with like not having conversations that centered around sex. And then, oh, something happened. Somebody got pregnant. Now we kind of need to talk about it. So it was always kind of like this reactive. Um, so from like, so if you grew up in like evangelical spaces, one. And I think too, to your point, like JJ, it's not just survival, but like, it's not important right now. Like right now, what's important is you're safe in school, right? You can walk home from school that's what's important so it's not that it was it was just a missed opportunity because it was like oh we'll get to this later and then now that you are in this quote-unquote safer environment it's no longer it's no longer a priority to to have a conversation about what it looks like to protect yourself because like when you live in certain communities you need to have that conversation right I mean and she talked about in the book a little bit about how um like the the young man who um ended up getting caught up because he had to take care of his family. So the only thing he can do in elementary school or middle school or whatever it was was sell drugs. Like that was his only opportunity. But he was like, my sister isn't going to do this. So she got to go to school, got to to graduate. So to your point, JJ, also like realizing who in the family is the one to say, I'm going to do all the crap so that you don't have to because our parents are just trying to survive. So it's like, there's so many different levels of like, yes, it's, some of it is like, yes, our parents should have been saying, yes, I was alive when MLK died and this is what it felt like. But it's also, like you said, JJ, like, okay, as the older sibling, whatever I know, I got to make sure y'all know. And then like, even I think about like my, me being intentional with my white friends. Um, Cause I like, growing up in Vegas, I was the only, but I, I was, I wasn't the only person of color. I was usually just the only black girl. So I was like black girl, Mexican girl, you know, Puerto Rican, whatever. So I never felt other because there was, others of us together but realizing as an adult like man I was the only black girl like actual black girl in a lot of my classes so even thinking about what it means to educate like our white friends about a shared experience that the, us other people of color happen to have um but it starts with dialogues like this right being a part of book being intentionally a part of book clubs that allow us to have conversations about a book that was kind of mediocre but at least it gets us talking right and then to go now, you know, follow up with a book that's a little bit more just kind of laid back and then come back and have the conversations again, um, I think is what's going to help. So I think my biggest takeaway from this book is being able to have a conversation like this with you guys versus my like frustration with no like details of here is here's the history of what happened and or here are future resources to move forward. I don't know if anyone has any other thoughts. I would love to hear if you're going to give a star rating to this book what your star rating is going to be I think I'm going to give it a three stars um 
to Alika's point, it's that uh, um, it it helped me that you said it was like her experience with some backing to it. Um, that's not what I went in thinking that was necessarily going to be. But when it's framed like that, I accept it better. Um, three stars is like, okay, wouldn't recommend. I'm not upset about I I loved that I read it so that we can talk about it. I love buddy reads anyway. And like, somebody can be like, let's read this encyclopedia. And I'm like, I'm in. Um, but I definitely like the best part was this conversation. I agree. I feel like I was thinking three. So I was like, I don't want to start it off. But one, I was thinking three, one, because of that perspective, I went in with the, kind of that forethought. And then I love a book that is going to start a dialogue. So I feel like a three is a good, like, and like I said, if it's on my bookshelf and you want to read it, go for it. But I'm not necessarily saying you've got to read this book. Um, okay. I would give it a four and we're just saying out of five, right? Four out yeah. of five. Okay. For the reason being, I think the subtitle is like the movement that white women forgot. I think there were a lot of things there to teach me and to learn. I liked a lot of the points that it raised. I didn't always like the writing style, how maybe things could have been connected here or there, or like some things I'm like, yep, I think we got this point. And so I'd either like more direct specific just stories, instances, or um, or maybe action items. Um, but I think it raised, a, to me, it raised a lot of points to just keep forefront of mind. I'd give it a, a three. A, I don't know about a solid three, but just a three. Um, Brittany, same. Um, yeah, I don't know that I'm going to be screaming like to the rooftops, like you guys should read this book. This is a great book. I definitely would like to read something else that I think maybe would be a, a better one for people to pick up. Um, and if, if anyone is out, you know, out there that I come across that might be interested in this or that it might be a good suggestion, I would definitely have a lot of those asterisk notes to give them. Alika, I do like how you put like, this was kind of like her story and she was like backing up or like her experience and how she was kind of like backing it up with, with facts. Hey, hey there. I'm just popping back in at the end of this episode to round out things. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you're enjoying kind of our raw and unfiltered discussion about our feelings about some of these books that we pick up and read. By no means are we swaying you to pick up a book or not pick up a book. We're just simply sharing our feelings. If you have read Hood Feminism or you plan to, please definitely share with us over on social media. You can message me at Books with J Rags over on Instagram. I'd love to hear your thoughts about this book or questions you have if you're considering picking this up. Okay, guys, talk to you later. Hey, book lovers, one last thing before you leave. Are you currently looking for a group to read and chat about books with? If so, I'd love to invite you to join us on our current buddy read of Anna Maria and the Fox by Lena De La Rosa. We'll be having a virtual meetup to discuss this book on Sunday, May 19th. All of the details, including the link to join the discussion and our monthly book thread can be found over on the Geneva app, which you can access by clicking the link in the show notes. Quick reminder that all books mentioned in this episode can also be found in the show notes. Thanks so much for joining us and wishing you a wonderful reading adventure until we meet again. Chat soon. Chat soon.